Okay, so um, maybe not everybody was here on Saturday, so I want to, so to recall what the idea of this morning's lecture, which are not lectures, is. So, um, so we decided um, that it would be probably most useful uh, this morning to have sort of really background basic uh, stuff uh, explained to you to try to clean the floor uh, before uh, uh, the lectures of this week. So uh, my, what I'll do to, right now is uh, just you know, to try to re recap sort of, it's sort of a tutorial, preparatory tutorial for some of what is going to happen this week. And uh, I shall try to refrain myself from <laughs> wanting to tell you more than uh, what I'll try to tell you. So this is not a course, right? This is just uh, background material. And most of you probably know already uh, most of what I'm going to say. But it's always useful to um, have a clear picture of uh, various concepts before they are used uh, uh, by, uh, you know, the, I mean, in, in Lawler, Sheffield, and uh, maybe uh, Smirnoff's lecture, we will hear a lot about our soft dimension, Gaussian free field, uh, Green's functions, and so on. And you all know more or less what it is, but it's maybe a good idea to have a quick recap of that. And anyway, so another reason for me, you know, to jumping in uh, this Monday morning is that one is that our lecturers, uh, lecturers are either are arriving today or have arrived yesterday and therefore are not ready or ready to give a lecture on Monday morning. That's a, just a practical uh, uh, reason so that we had to set up something for the morning. And, uh, and what was the other reason? Um, anyway. Uh, and the other thing is that I realized probably that uh, uh, most of you have not slept much more than I did uh, due to the fireworks and um, uh, waking up by the brass band at 6 o'clock in the morning. I don't know how, how it, maybe you, you were protected by sound, soundproof. But anyway, um, so I will not be able to, be, to go very fast because I'm uh, <laughs> slightly uh, tired. Uh, okay, so, so this morning it will... I will talk about um, Hausdorff dimensions and Hausdorff dimension of random sets. And uh, this is a concept that already has appeared many times uh, in the first uh, two weeks. Uh, but uh, that will be sort of central in uh, Greg's uh, lecture. And uh, Greg is sitting in the back. And more, everything that I'll tell you here, I learned from him when I, I, or from his papers when I was a student. And so he can correct me, uh, should feel free to correct me as soon as uh, he feels that I'm going off track. Um, okay, so the, the other thing is uh, I, I, I just want to say about the, the, this week's free lecturers. So lecturers, which, uh, so in a way, you will see that, I mean, there are, I think, sort of, uh, in principle, more advanced lectures than the... Uh, than the foundational courses of the first two weeks. Uh, we hope that the first two weeks will have been a good preparation for, these, uh, for this third week. But uh, I insist again, I said it already on, on Saturday, but it's important that uh, you know, if, if, if you don't dare to ask the, to tell the, the lecturers that it's too fast or too something, uh, you can always come to the organizers and tell us, and then we can uh, try to tell them. Uh, okay, so I, I will talk about Hausdorff dimensions. Um, so this is basically the, the natural or the best or one natural way to measure the size or some sort of size of a metric space. So imagine that you take um, uh, A, D, some metric space. So maybe I'll start with uh, uh, metric space. And imagine that, for simplicity, that it has a diameter smaller than 1. 
Every, this is not necessary, but it will be make life use uh, simpler later on. So, of course, in practice, uh, in, every, in everything that Greg, for instance, will say, um, we will take A to be a subset, a compact subset, for instance, of uh, the plane. Or, right? So it will, you can view it as a subset of, R, of RD. Um, we can view, uh, so everything works in that uh, context, but here you, we may say that A is a subset, for instance, uh, of uh, R2, say. That will be a typical uh, framework when uh, A will be a sort of a SLE curve, for instance. Okay, so what you, what you want to do is for any positive alpha, you can define H um, alpha of A. So that would be the infimum of uh, the sum from J uh, equal to 1 to infinity of the diameter, so you take the infimum of the sum of the diameters to the power alpha where aj is the covering Right, so the union, countable union of the AJs is uh, equal to A. So, of course, just a few remarks is that in this infimum, uh, since you are taking an infimum, uh, you can take uh, your coverings to be uh, disjoint, because otherwise you just take, uh, you know, A2 would be, uh, replace A2 by A2 minus A1, and etc. and this will just reduce the diameter. So you can take coverings or these joint coverings. And um, that's one remark. And the other simple remark, of course, is that uh, uh, given the fact that we have chosen the diameter to be smaller than 1, uh, all these diameters here are uh, smaller than 1 because the AJs are subsets of A. And um, therefore, uh, if alpha is smaller than alpha prime, then uh, H alpha of A is larger than uh, H alpha primary. Okay? So, um, if you imagine, if you remember sort of our d-dimensional space, uh, and uh, you, you may want say to say, imagine that take the unit square, or maybe unit square doesn't have diameter, well, uh, some, some square, and we want to look at this sort of things. This diameter squared will be correspond will be rough. I mean, will be similar to the area of the AJ. So when you take the sum of the areas of the AJs, you will get something close to the area of A. Uh, so it's clear that if you're in two-dimensional space, uh, the value alpha equal two is a good one. And if you take alpha, you know, larger than two or smaller than two strictly, then it's a simple exercise to see that. Uh, this H alpha of A would be zero infinity. So it's very sensitive uh, to alpha, this uh, H alpha of A. Uh, we'll see in a moment why. So that's why we are going to define definition is that the dimension of A is nothing else than the uh, supremum of the set of alpha such that um, H alpha of A is positive, which is also the infimum of the set of alpha such that H alpha of A is equal to zero. Okay? So that's the definition of the Hausdorff dimension. And we'll just use the notion, uh, I'll, it's called the Hausdorff dimension basically because you have other notions of dimensions. Um, so, 
Maybe I just want to make a, a little comment uh, here at this point. Just uh, if you take capital A to be a countable set, okay, just a countable set with countably many points. Um, uh, the, uh, it's clear, basically, you can say that the, the H, uh, I mean, that the dimension will be zero, right? Because you could say just the each AJ to be each individual point. Uh, but you could also say, well, uh, if, we, if, if we would decide that we don't allow the AJs to be sort of uh, individual, I mean, individual points that, you know, you need AJs to be some open sets or something like that, then this will still be okay because you could take a sum of, you know, on around each individual point, you can take a very, very small interval and the size of the interval becomes smaller and smaller with, uh, when you go along uh, your set of uh, points. Um, and therefore, uh, what I just, I've just said about, uh, the, about uh, individual points, you can use it also in order to see that the countable union, I mean, if you take the Hausdorff dimension of a countable union of sets, then it will be the dimension of the largest one of them. So the, the fact that we basically, we, we take the infimum, so let me be clearer, the fact that we take the infimum over coverings like this, where we don't specify anything about the size of the coverings, right? So we are allowed to take them as small as we want, and we can allow, we, are not, we don't need to take them all of the, you know, all the AJs of the same size or, all the AJs to be certain balls of, a certain, of the same radius that we allow to fluctuate these things. This uh, is a simple exercise then that to check that basically you can use uh, this in order to make the dimension, I mean to control the dimension of the countable union of sets. So that's just a, a side remark. Okay, so um, Right, because very often, and this will show up later, you, we might have said, you know, might have wanted to use another notion of definition, which is something like, if I have A and I have a, my metric space, uh, I want to just restrict myself to the number of epsilon type balls that I need to cover it, to cover my set A and uh, to count how, what this minimal number is. Um, and this would give rise to another notion of dimension, which is closely related to the Hausdorff dimension but which will not have this countably, I mean, this uh, way to control uh, countable union of, house of, of, of offsets. Okay, so uh, maybe I just want to, to, to make uh, one comment nevertheless, which is that um, we want to define for any positive epsilon we are going to define something different, which is H alpha epsilon. Which, was, which is basically the same that H alpha of A, except that we are going to put a constraint on our covering, namely that all AJs have to have a diameter smaller than epsilon. So this is just the infimum over the sum from J equal 1 to infinity of AJ to the alpha, AJ covering with, for any J, the diameter of AJ smaller than epsilon. So clearly, um, H alpha of epsilon is larger than uh, I mean, the, the smaller alpha, the larger H alpha epsilon, because you restrict yourself to small, less and less uh, possible coverings. So if alpha prime is smaller than alpha, oh, whoops, epsilon prime smaller than epsilon, H epsilon prime uh, alpha of A larger than H alpha epsilon of A larger than H alpha of A. So, you see, I'm going very slowly, so it should be. Vincent uh, complained that we, you had to work on a Saturday morning, but now you have to work on a bank holiday, so it's even worse, but uh, okay. So 
another thing then you want to define is um, H alpha zero plus of A, which would be the um, supremum when epsilon positive of H alpha epsilon of A. Of course, because the supremum is the limit when epsilon goes to zero of this guy. So uh, there's a simple lemma uh, which says that um, that all these, I mean, alpha, H alpha zero plus, H alpha epsilon, and H alpha itself, despite the fact that they are the, not the same, um, they all have this, uh, they all touch zero uh, at the same time, basically, which so basically the dimension of A is equal to the first time, so the infimum of the alpha positive such that H alpha zero plus of A is zero. Right, so in other words, for any epsilon, So this is a very easy uh, remark. So, so basically what this tells you that here you might as well take you know, coverings by, you, you can constrain your AJ to be covering by very small guys. Everything has to be, have a diameter smaller than epsilon. So all these AJ to the power alpha will be something smaller than epsilon to the alpha. But as I said before, uh, you can you know, adjust the only constraint is that they all have to be of size smaller than epsilon, but uh, they could be as small as, as you want uh, there. So why is this? This is sort of uh, simple. So I could leave it as an exercise or... Uh, uh, well, if you take beta... Take beta larger than alpha. Um, then uh, we have H alpha of A, which is equal to zero. And we want to prove that H alpha epsilon of A is equal to zero. So we take sine positive uh, some Theta positives and uh, small than one, say. And then because we have this, then we can find an AJ such that a covering, such that the sum of uh, the AJs to the beta uh, is smaller than eta epsilon to the beta, right? So epsilon is fixed, eta is fixed. So we take a covering like this, and because you have this, then this implies in particular that for any j, aj is smaller than epsilon, because otherwise this inequality would not hold, and this is smaller than eta. Right? Uh, so epsilon is also smaller than 1, and therefore you get that uh, the infimum of all epsilon coverings, I mean covering of uh, things smaller than epsilon, is smaller than eta for any eta. Right? So So this is true for any epsilon, therefore uh, h, beta epsilon of, uh, h beta epsilon of A is equal to zero. And once you have this, then uh, this is true for any uh, beta larger than alpha. And therefore, uh, we get uh, this. And uh, when we have this, then we have this by obvious uh, uh, monotonicity. Okay. 
So let me just remind what I made a list of things I shouldn't forget to tell you. Yes. So maybe I should uh, immediately sort of quote a consequence here of, of this little uh, feature here that uh, which is the following, which is that suppose that there exists the sequence Epsilon n going to zero, such that for any n uh, there exists a covering of A by less then um, uh, n, n uh, by less than epsilon n to the minus beta balls of radius epsilon n. Okay. So assume that now you have a you have your your uh, set A. And that there's a way uh, to find a sequence that goes to zero in such a way that the number of balls that you need to cover it, uh, your set A, the number of epsilon n balls that you need to cover it, does not uh, grow faster than epsilon n to the minus beta. Well, then the dimension of A is smaller than uh, beta. Right, so this tells you that you have a simple criteria to find an upper bound uh, for house of dimension. Uh, it's just about uh, uh, in, in a way it's about the volume of the epsilon n neighborhood of A that you are looking at. Right? If you think a little bit about it, that's a criterion of that sort. So why is that? Well, this is just because well, sort of obvious, right? <laughs> because if you look at the sum, if you take, uh, uh, maybe I should have taken alpha here, but so take, say gamma strictly larger than beta, okay? and look at H uh, uh, gamma of A, And uh, if you look at the definition there, I mean, I, you didn't actually don't need this, but if you look at the definition that you have over there, it will be smaller than what you get for this a n covering by epsilon n balls, and so you will get uh, sort of a constant. Well, balls have diameter two epsilon, so put it at a constant epsilon n uh, to the minus uh, to the gamma. Uh, times uh, the number of balls n uh, times epsilon n to the uh, minus beta, and uh, this goes to zero. Okay. When n goes to infinity, therefore this is zero, and then dimension a is indeed smaller than gamma. Okay, so this is really uh, just the, the basic definition of uh, what is a, a house stuff dimension. And of course, you can choose, uh, you know, you can take, uh, there are plenty of good exercises to take your favorite set and uh, that looks fractal and compute its dimension and uh, check that the dimension is what you believe it is. And also the fact that if you take any, you know, thing in D dimensional space, uh, an open set, it will have dimension D and so on. 
So just one remark that, uh, which was actually probably the initial reason why I chose to, to define this H uh, epsilon stuff, is it's a very easy exercise uh, uh, also to see that this uh, quantity H alpha uh, of A, which is here, when alpha is strictly larger than the dimension, this will be zero. That's the definition of the dimension. But when alpha is strictly smaller than the dimension, this will be infinite. And the reason is just that if alpha would be strictly larger than zero, uh, strictly smaller than the, the dimension, okay, if you look at the H alpha A here guy that we have here, the covering is made by all the, by just small guys. And so if the dimension is smaller, you have an excess of uh, epsilon to minus some power in front. So it's a simple exercise to check that this H alpha of A would be infinite as soon as alpha is strictly smaller than the dimension. Right? So as I said at the beginning, if you fix A and you look this as a function of alpha, it's very sensitive. It starts being infinite, and then there's a value where you jump down to zero. And of course, it raises the question about what happens exactly at the value alpha equals to d. Would this guy be finite? Would it be still zero? Would it be infinite? And the answer is, of course, that <laughs> it depends on the set A. There is no general rule. Um, and uh, if you want to know more, then you have to you know, do something uh, more careful than just putting a power alpha. You could put some correction terms. You put some log terms of uh, the diameter of AJ or stuff like that. So there are plenty of ways to, uh, you know, find a finer tuning. Actually, for many uh, random fractals, uh, usually, I mean, for many random fractals, this guy would actually be zero at the, at the dimension. So this is just a side remark. But, um, now, uh, what, uh, so, yes? By the set? You mean what here? H alpha of A? Ah, well, OK, good point. So uh, let's put it this way. The, this, you, might, you might say this guy uh, would be infinite. Good point, thanks. Yeah, what I just said was uh, in this direction. So thanks a lot. So this guy would jump from zero to infinity, from infinity to zero. Of course, yeah. So the point was just that if you take the covering by I the guy itself, it's not infinite if you look at it here. Okay. So if you want this guy to, to the infimum to be infinite, uh, simply doesn't work. So it's the h alpha of zero plus, uh, which is jumping from infinity. Okay, so um, what did I want to say next? Um, okay, so now uh, we start sort of uh, l discussing uh, things that are uh, maybe a bit less trivial. So how do you find the lower bounds? So uh, so there's a, actually uh, a description, an alternative description of what the Hausdorff dimension is that involves a notion of energy or notions of, uh, uh, I mean, using some measure on the set A. So the idea is the following. So if if there is, um, if mu, say, is a finite measure on A, and if alpha, say, is positive, um, then we can define the, say, alpha energy 
of uh, mu as follows. It's I alpha of mu. It's just the integral, uh, a double integral on uh, A times A. So mu of dx, mu of dy, divided by, okay, now I would say the distance between x and y to the power alpha. So in what follows, I will probably just uh, take the uh, some A to be a subset of a two-dimensional, d-dimensional space. So I will just use a uh, module of x minus y instead of. Okay, now um, I think Vincent mentioned that uh, one important thing he learned from me was to draw uh, interfaces with chokes with two colors. Uh, I did not make a, uh, this spent six months in Switzerland, so I, I don't know how to clean uh, windows uh, properly, but I will try to uh, do as he's do, try to learn from him how to clean efficiently. So what is important is to notice that uh, so the energy uh, of a measure, right, if alpha is positive, um, you see that it's not necessarily a finite thing. Right? Because if you would, for instance, take mu to have an atom somewhere, Right? If mu would have an atom, then this would be infinite as soon as, as alpha is strictly positive because you would have mu of dx, mu of dx, so there was a positive probability that x is equal to y, and uh, then this thing would blow up. Right? So uh, its first remark is it's not necessary that uh, the energy of a measure is finite. And if you think about it, if you want to have a, a measure with finite energy, then it means that masses uh, should, I mean, the mass should be sort of spread, I mean, the masses should be spread sufficiently uh, away from each other by mu, right? So you want to, to beat the fact that, the fact that uh, near neighboring guys are, uh, there are too many uh, neighboring guys. So it's a simple exercise uh, that you can do if you have time and if you, it's not obvious to you uh, immediately to check that um, uh, if you take, a, say, d-dimensional, if A would be the uh, cube or unit ball or whatever, and if you take mu to be the Lebesgue measure, well, then you are just looking at, uh, you know, whether mu of dx, mu of dy, or x minus y to some power alpha converges or not. And it's clear that, you know, we, we change our variables and so on, and dr over r uh, converge, uh, diverges, but uh, just narrowly and so on, that the energy, the alpha energy of the Lebesgue measure in d dimension uh, basically will jump from, uh, would st stop being infinite at alpha equal, uh, I mean, just after alpha equal to d. Right? So the, the energy of the Lebesgue measure in d dimensions sort of uh, stops being infinite exactly at uh, when alpha, e I mean, uh, goes through the dimension of the space. So it seems that this is a good way to try to look at, uh, uh, to, to describe uh, uh, the house of dimension uh, of a set. So, so the lemma, and uh, which is uh, due to, uh, well, sometimes called Frostman's lemma, sometimes called Frostman's theorem, sometimes, uh, well, anyway, it's always Frostman who is quoted there. Uh, Actually, it's, um, you've, le you've learned from Nicolas that uh, he likes to, to show pictures of the, uh, of the mathematicians he's quoting. Uh, 
I don't have any pictures, but uh, I can tell you the first name of Frostman. Who knows the first name of Frostman? <laughs> so he's called Otto. So anyway, I don't know why I'm saying that, but uh, it's a funny first name. So, uh, so what, what can we do? Uh, what did Frostman do? Well, he basically explained how to relate the notion of dimension uh, of his friend uh, Felix Hausdorf uh, of dimensions to uh, notions of uh, energy. So here, if there exists a finite positive measure, with finite, I mean, when I say finite, it's sort of obvious. Positive means it's non-zero, uh, supported on A with uh, I, uh, say, alpha of A finite. So what does this mean, right? So this means that there is a way to put some mass onto your uh, set A, right? To spread them away enough in such a way that the integral over there converges. Right? And as, we ju as I just told you about the uh, about uh, d dimensions, you know, this is not always the case. You need somehow in order to be able to spread mass in such a way that the mass is sufficiently separated in a way, does not concentrate. Uh, you need that the space. You need the space to be sufficiently large. So the consequence here is then the dimension of A is larger than alpha. And in fact, um, there is a converse to this thing that says that if the dimension so of course, the strict inequalities goes the other way around. But if uh, you take any alpha strictly smaller than the dimension, uh, then there's a way to put a measure on it. But uh, so, there are, so this is really an equivalence. The fact that the our first definition of the dimension uh, involving these coverings, and here we have a description in terms of existence or non-existence of certain measures that spread things out, uh, and there's really an equivalence between the two. What you will need in uh, Greg's lecture and for random fractals is just this direction. So if, the, you, know, uh, if you know the dimension, then, uh, no, if you know a measure, uh, then you get a lower bound on the dimension. Actually, the other way is slightly, I mean, more, maybe the proof is more difficult in the other direction. Uh, but So just to say two words now, you see that we have uh, just said that in order to find an upper bound on the dimensions, we had to deal with coverings. That was a simple way to get an upper bound. And here, to get a lower bound, what you need is to find a measure. And it can, make it, you know, it can be sort of more complicated. It looks like a more complicated job to you know, construct explicitly a measure on the set that satisfies certain properties uh, than to, uh, you know, control, uh, to control um, uh, certain uh, coverings. And this is why sort of uh, usually, you know, people say, you know, it's more difficult. Upper bounds for house of dimension are easier than lower bounds. It's not always true, but uh, that's, that's, that's the idea. OK, so well, how would you prove this? Um, well, maybe I'll make a first remark, which is that uh, if a n is a disjoint covering, so when I say disjoint, that the sets AJ are disjoint, covering of A, then uh, 
Whoops. So it's the energy of the measure, right? I hope everybody uh, corrected me here. So, so if a n is this joint covering of a, when you take it uh, i alpha of uh, mu, uh, this is equal to this. So maybe for convenience, uh, just for notation, we're going to decide that uh, A is a subset of RD. Just uh, in order not to write this, but everything I say is uh, anyway true uh, in all cases. So, right, so this is. Uh, the definition, and uh, of course, because the A uh, are disjoint, you can uh, say that this is larger than the sum over N of A N cross A N, because they are disjoint of D mu of X, D mu of Y over X minus Y to the uh, alpha. And uh, therefore, you can say it's larger than the sum over n of mu, mu of a n squared divided by the diameter of a n to the alpha. I hope I didn't screw up anything. Right? X minus y when you respect to a n cross a n is larger than, is, is uh, smaller than uh, the diameter of a n, so you have an inequality like this. Now, maybe I'm going to go to view this in a slightly uh, strange, start with a sli slightly strange way. When I write mu of e squared, uh, mu of a squared, uh, then you can write this as sum of mu of a n. squared, and I want somehow to uh, find the, an upper bound of uh, mu of a uh, squared by something um, involving this. Right? To get an upper bound of this uh, by something involving uh, this, therefore. Right? And we know this is finite. And we see what, what happens. So, well, we just want to use uh, Cauchy-Schwarz, so we write this is the sum of mu of aj divided by aj to the alpha over 2 times aj to the alpha over 2, everything squared. And so, by Cauchy-Schwarz, then you get that this is smaller than this guy on the one side. And on the other side, what you have is just the sum of aj to the alpha. And therefore, what we get is that for any aj disjoint covering, the sum of the aj to the alpha smaller than mu of e of a squared divided, well, this guy is smaller than i alpha of mu. So this is just a trivial thing that uh, Cauchy-Schwarz type inequality tells you that get this thing. Uh, did I do something wrong here? Uh, 
It's the other way around, right? So now you're happy because what we know is that we have assumed that the energy is finite. So this says that for any covering, we have a uniform lower bound on the sum of the aj to the power alpha. So therefore, if a alpha of mu is finite, then we get that uh, h. Uh, so we have something stronger than we have over there, that h alpha of a is larger than mu of a squared divided by i alpha of mu, which is uh, positive. And therefore, the dimension of A is larger than alpha. So notice that what we get here is that uh, H alpha of A is uh, strictly uh, positive. So in many cases, as I've said to you before, we, we are going to expect that when we are exactly, when alpha is exactly equal to the dimension, we are not quite sure that what happens to H alpha. And therefore, uh, usually in order to find a lower bound on the dimension, so if we want to prove that, say, uh, the dimension is larger than a certain number uh, uh, u, then we, what we're going to do is basically for any alpha strictly smaller than u, we construct a measure with finite energy. And this will say that for any alpha strictly smaller than u, the dimension is larger, larger or equal to alpha, and therefore the dimension is larger or equal to, uh, to u itself. Okay, any questions? Um, so now maybe I want to uh, explain to you how to use these deterministic things uh, when you have a random set. Okay. So three Hausdorff dimension. of random sets. So suppose, for instance, that A is a random compact, say, subset of 0, 1 squared, or any sort of uh, any uh, subdomain of uh, of R2. Uh, and we want to describe, so how, what can we say, how to how do we manage to say something on its dimension. Well, the first thing to have in mind is that in general, when you are looking at, when you are constructing at a random uh, object that is a subset of, uh, in the plane, and uh, that uh, you are interested in and that you believe is a fractal set, 
usually it is you know defined by many uh, random inputs you know that come together and you're looking at the scaling limits of uh, like what we did in percola percolation interfaces or things like that and uh, therefore even though what happens at different uh, I mean different uh, regions in the plane is, is not independent you have enough independence somehow uh, and this is why this is a random fractal set you know you have some some sort of self-similar structure that goes on with some sort of uh, weak dependence going on. So you would expect that this dimension uh, uh, to be basically always the same, right? And uh, that sort of different places of A look more or less the same, and the different, the di local dim and locally the dimension here, there, or that of A would still always be the same. So you would expect. So when I say you take a random uh, compact set, the type of compact set we have in mind is something like, say, an SLE curve. Uh, and for such, or for a Brownian motion, or uh, the set of double points on a Brownian path, or something like that. But the important thing is that you, we, it's not a compact set where we first toss the dimension and then we, uh, we, we so, Usually, the dimension of this type of uh, random Cantor set we are interested in is always the same. Right? So you have some sort of zero or one law that will tell you that uh, the dimension is always the same. So, so it's not what we are interested in. It's not, it's not a recipe for any random fractal set, but basically for most of the random fractal sets that uh, we are interested in. And uh, if you want to keep this in mind, you can just say, well, uh, in Greg's lecture today, later today, you will get the proof, uh, I think, full proof of the fact that uh, uh, SLE is something that constructs a continuous curve in the plane. So far, you have seen that uh, SLE is, uh, I think, I'm not mistaken, but Vincent is hiding somewhere. So, some, some, so, so far, you have seen that. Uh, uh, you know, SLE is a Leuven, defines a Leuvener chain and so on, and, and in certain cases, for instance, the percolation exploration interfaces, because it's a scaling limit of a discrete uh, interface, you can see that it corresponds to a continuous curve in the plane. And uh, there are some non-trivial estimates that you will see this afternoon that show you that SLE actually corresponds always to, uh, at least when kappa is not equal to A, to a continuous curve in the two-dimensional plane. So. The, uh, the idea you should have in mind right now is suppose that A, for instance, is a random compact subset of the plane like the intersection or the beginning of an SLE curve in the neighborhood of the origin or something like that. Okay, so how do, uh, can we do this? Well, as you have already heard, and this was also valid in the, uh, uh, actually in the random map, uh, also you heard about uh, dimensions. Uh, you have these first moment estimates, second moment estimates, and something like that. So, what do you usually get? So, assume, so let's take uh, A, upper bound. So, assume that you can find a constant beta so that. Uh, for some beta there exists uh, say n c positive you have a bound of the sort that for any z uh, say in zero one squared um, the probability that the distance between z and A is smaller than epsilon, that this is smaller, uh, so for any Z and for any epsilon, uh, this is uh, smaller than constant epsilon to the uh, beta. Okay. Well, then, Almost surely, the dimension of A is smaller than 2 minus beta. So 
So let me prove this for you. This is uh, actually very simple. So of course I'm not uh, I'm not going for optimal statements. I just going for those type of statements that we are actually going to use in uh, that Greg is going to use. So you see that here it is important that in the condition that this thing is uniform. So it's a, once you chose beta and c, this is uh, supposed to hold for any for all z simultaneously. Okay, so how do you, uh, what can you do now? So, well, the idea is just to use this, our first uh, criteria that was to say that we want to fight to find uh, some explicit epsilon n going to zero uh, such that uh, you can find a covering and so on. Right, so the idea is to say that almost surely you can find some covering somewhere. Okay, so so let's go. So, so first of all, you might just say, well, let's divide our square into small uh, subsquares of size two, two, 2 to the minus n. So we take 0, 1, and we're going to divide it into tiny subsquares you know, of uh, 2 to the minus n. And the idea is just to say, well, we're going just to use a very uh, stupid covering of uh, A, which is for e each, so we fix N, and for each little square, either A intersects the, this little square, and then we take it, the entire square, or A doesn't intersect the square, and we don't take it. So, of course, this will give you a covering, so you get a covering of A by uh, 2 to the minus n sized uh, little square. So uh, let uh, n cap this would be just the number of uh, 2 to the minus n uh, subsquares that A intersects. Okay, so what do we know? We know that for each little square, call it S, for each of these guys, you know that the probability that S intersects A, Well, if it intersects A, that means that some I mean that the corner, say, of the square is a distance, uh, or the center of the square is a distance uh, less than 2 to the minus n of A. And therefore, we have the upper bound there. This is smaller than C uh, two to the minus n to the beta. And therefore, the expected value. And n is just smaller than, well, we have how many squares do you have? 2 to the minus n squared times the probability that each of them uh, is them. So c times 2 to the minus n to the beta. Right, so the expected value of n n smaller than constant times uh, 2 to the minus n times 2 minus beta.
OK, so now maybe I can leave it as a very simple exercise. Um, so you have this sequence of random variables n, which counts the number of uh, little squares you need uh, for your covering. And you have an upper bound on their expectation. Uh, so now take, say, alpha strictly larger than 2 minus beta. And now you can show by your favorite uh, Markov uh, inequality or whatever uh, you want that with positive probability, this implies that, that with positive probability, um, there exists a subsequence such that uh, for any k uh, a to the n k is uh, smaller than uh, c, well, then 2 to the minus n to the alpha. Right, if this would not be the case, then clearly something would go wrong here, but okay. Did I say something? Thank you. And then there's maybe something there on the other side also. Uh, yeah. Thank you. So once you have this, well, no, actually we can show that this, almost surely this is this. Sorry. Sorry. Well, you might as well just take uh, nk to be n anyway. but. <laughs> Let's, let's uh, not worry about that. So you can just take any Borel Cantelli or whatever you want. It's at Markov. It's sort of trivial. And therefore, what you end up with is that, well, the criterion that we had before applies. Almost surely, you can find a covering, uh, a sequence, uh, epsilon n, which is 2 to the minus n that goes to 0, such that you can find a covering in such a way that the number of guys is smaller than uh, two, two, uh, this epsilon to the uh, alpha, and therefore you get that the dimension of A is smaller than alpha, almost sure. Okay. So finding the upper bound uh, is basically very simple, and indeed what has been told to you several times in the first two weeks, which is just that uh, Well, when I say show that, uh, so, sorry about the NK, right? It's just Markov plus where I can tell you, right? Um, so indeed, that when you had an, a bound like this, then gives you, a, for free, an upper bound in terms of the dimension. So if you remember, for instance, you have, you have seen things like, uh, you know, uh, what is the probability that an SLE6 goes to distance smaller than or epsilon of uh, uh, point Z? So you take a point Z that is, say, uh, sufficient, uh, some, somehow in the bulk, sort of uh, not, not close to the boundary of the initial domain, then you have something like this, where here this is uh, one-fourth that you would have got, right? Remember these one arm, I mean, these two arm estimates corresponding to the probability that the SLE you know, goes to a certain distance of a point. And indeed, these estimates for free 
gives you the fact that the dimension of the curve, if you know it's a curve, uh, would be smaller than sevenfold. And uh, by the way, I mean, in this type of thing, in all the revealment theorems and uh, you know, randomized algorithms that you've seen, also you had this uh, problem of you know, going from the, you wanted to show that the number of things you have to ask, the expected number of things you have to ask <coughs> uh, corresponds to actual number. Okay, forget about that. Okay, so now how you do uh, the lower bound. Recipe. Well, we want to use uh, uh, Frostman's lemma, right? So we want to use the we want to construct a measure in such a way uh, that you get. Uh, I mean, you want to show that with positive probability you can construct a measure that has finite energy. Um, and remember, a criterion was to. I mean, we want to find a measure mu such that the integral d mu of x, d mu of y over x minus y to the alpha is finite. That's the goal. Now, one way to prove that something is finite is to prove something where, where the expectation is finite. So if you want to construct something where the expectation is finite, um, well, expectation of this energy will give you know, some expected value, and then you have two points, you know, integral d mu x, d mu y over x minus y to the alpha. So if you look at this interchange between the expectation and uh, this integral in x and y, very quickly you see that indeed you, what you have to look at, you know, to look at expected values of things involving two points. And you want to prove that the expected value of things involving two points um, that you know, have an upper bound on them to say that this will beat the x minus y to the alpha on, on the other side. So, so that's the, the philosophy. So the recipe is basically assume that. So I'm just going to give you a, a number of uh, conditions. Sometimes they are not actually sat exactly satisfied, but uh, most of the time they are, and if, when they are not, you can adapt it. Um, so assume that the first thing is that the probability that, so if there exists beta, and there exists C1, C2 positive, such that for any z, so in uh, 0, 1 squared, The probability, so this is the one point estimate. And what we want is something stronger than we had what we had here, namely what is usually called up to constants estimates. So in the in various lectures in the first two weeks, this was a Quotation marks was a probability that distance between Z and A is smaller than epsilon is, this is what this meant. So note again that the constants do not depend on Z, uh, of course, nor an epsilon. And, and, Second condition, which is that for any z and 0, 1 squared, and for any y and 0, 1 squared, um, the probability that they are both a distance smaller than epsilon of a. So we want an upper bound here. So the upper bound is going to involve, of course, the probability that each of them is uh, so, uh, c times epsilon to the 2 beta. 
So this would be basically the square of, I mean, the probability that this one is in there times the probability that y is in there, right? So if they would be independent, this is what you would get. Now, just, it is quite clear that if, imagine, if you imagine that x and y are very close to each other, that this will not hold anymore because, you know, if x is equal to y, you don't have a two beta, you have a one, only one beta there. So you should understand, so this upper bound is, has to do with the fact that, you know, how much do, does this, uh, the fact that z is close to a and y is close to a, how quickly does this decorrelate when uh, x and y get, uh, far, I mean, repel from each other? So what you want here is to put an x minus y to the beta. Actually, beta is not really necessary here, but it's just. So maybe we can take beta smaller than 2. Anyway, we, you want something which has, uh, in the end, it will have dimension 2 minus beta. So you rather want beta not to be too large anyway. Okay, so what is the conclusion going to be of this statement? Well, given the structure of the lecture so far, you can guess. Then, well, uh, we have to be slightly careful. Caution. We, we want to say that the conclusion is that the dimension of A is 2 minus beta, right? Because this gives you the, the upper bound here, and we want to say that this decorrelation will enable us to get the lower bound. Now, we have to be slightly careful because maybe our set A, you know, imagine that your set A has, that you first toss a coin to decide whether it's going to be a guy of uh, dimension 2 minus beta or whether it's going to be the empty set or whether it's going to be uh, uh, some guy of smaller dimension. Then you see that if you do this, then all these uh, estimates will hold, right? Because, you know, tossing a coin at first will just reduce the probabilities of uh, the guys being there, so that is not a problem. And uh, both lower and upper bound would still hold here. So the conclusion is that the probability that the dimension of A is equal to 2 minus beta is positive. And remember that the first previous statement was that because of this, we knew that it was almost surely smaller than 2 minus beta. So in terms of dimension of SLE, it's a little bit, then you would need some, I mean, if you want to conclude, you would need some sort of 0-1 law uh, in order to say, well, if it has a positive probability to have dimension 2 minus beta, then it is always 2 minus beta. But, you know, for instance, if you want to apply this to SLE just for, for uh, as a sort of little remark, you would need to say something But I don't hide too many, I mean, there are very simple things uh, to say here that I don't want, no need to hide them. So the remark is that, so for instance, for SLE curves. So how would you, you know, prove this type of guy? Whoops. Uh, when gamma is an SLE curve. Well, the idea would be to say, imagine that you're in the upper half plane, H. You start, you have a curve, SLE curve, that starts from zero. Imagine it's uh, one of the simple SLEs. Now, you want to apply this to something, so you want to say now something like, what is, so what, you want to decide what is you going to be A, to what sort of A you are going to apply this. Well, you have a problem, which is that um, 
if I take a point, say, here, you have these estimates that tell you, that will tell you, and that you will see uh, also again, that will tell you, you are able to estimate pretty well what the probability is that the SLE curves goes to the neighborhood of a point here. But this point is in the inside of my domain, so this you can estimate pretty well. But when the, if the point Z is on the boundary, this uh, estimate that you're going to derive here is not going to be hold anymore. So you will get another exponent having to do with the you know, exponents and the half plane that you've seen also uh, in the case of percolation. So there's no hope uh, if you take the curve gamma or the curve gamma intersected with uh, the, a square around zero to get uniform estimates like this. So what you have to do is that you have to choose, basically say, a square here, which is fixed and inside the domain. So imagine that you take here, I don't know, uh, minus 1, 1 times 1, 3. Okay. And you're going to choose A to be gamma intersected with the square. And then the statement you're going to prove, I mean, the, well, the, way, the, the way to get these estimates here and there are going to be for precisely for uh, the curve gamma intersected with the square. Then you will get this sort of uniform estimates. And then you will get, as a conclusion, that the probability that the dimension of gamma is intersected with the square is what you think it is, with positive probability. Of course, actually, the intersection of gamma with the square might be empty, right? because the curve might just not go through the square. Right? And this is not in contradiction with the fact that the conclusion here is just that the probability that it is equal to 2 minus beta is strictly positive, because the, our set uh, A might actually be empty. Okay? And if you know this is true for any square that, that is away from the origin, then you will, you will be able to conclude something about the dimension of the entire curve using this uh, countable, uh, I mean, the countable uh, additivity or uh, property of house of dimensions. So right, you can take larger and larger square, and for any square uh, that is away from the origin or, or for any given square, you prove that the dimension is uh, uh, 2 minus beta uh, or smaller, and then you just need to find one where it is uh, 2 minus beta. So you need... To conclude, you need some sort of zero one law at some point, but which does not, uh, which is usually easy. Okay. So how is the method? So uh, so maybe if you want the statement to be entirely correct, maybe we say that uh, a. Well, did I say already? That, so a is a random compact. Because, of course, uh, I mean, if A would be uh, sort of uh, the set of rational numbers or something like that, you would <laughs> get a problem uh, in terms of the dimension. So the methods of proof is you want, we want to show that, so take some alpha strictly smaller than 2 minus beta, that with positive probability, There exists some finite measure on, uh, on A such that I alpha of mu is finite. So it's important to see that the measure mu, of course, because it's supported on, uh, I mean, the support of uh, mu is A and that A is random. The measure mu is going to be random. You have to adapt it to choose the right measure depending on the fractal you choose. Okay. So how does this work? Well, let's try to do something similar than what we did here. 
So if we use the same uh, type of uh, estimates that we have here, so we divide, we take epsilon n to be 2 to the minus n, divide uh, 0, 1 squared into the smallest subsquares. and count the number of subsquares number uh, capital n n of subsquares that intersect a so it's exactly the same as what we have there And so now, instead of having just an upper bound, we get both an upper and a lower bound. So So what we have is that the expected value of nn is smaller than c2 times 2 to the uh, n to the 2 minus beta, and it's larger than c1 times 2 to the n times 2 minus beta. Right? That's what you get just by the first estimate that you have there. Okay? Because this expected number is just the sum of the probability that each of them intersects and the probability that each of them intersects. So maybe you have to change uh, some constants here. Uh, you know, if you intersect, then you are not far away. And if you're not far away, you intersect. So it's simple. OK. So that's one thing. And now if you just want to look at expected value of n, n squared, so you're going to look at the sum over all pairs of squares, S and S prime uh, subsquares, of the probability that uh, A intersects A and uh, A intersects S and A intersects S prime. This is just if you expand, you know, you say N, N is the sum of the indicator function over that uh, a intersects uh, each subsquare, and then you expand the, the, squ the square, and you get exactly this. And this sum is, of course, exactly something you have bounded here. Okay. So what you get very quickly is that somehow something like you get that this is smaller, that some constant times, okay, 2 to the minus n to the 2 beta. That's what the epsilon to the 2 beta that comes out over there. And then you have a sum of all s and s prime of something having to do with the 1 over the distance between center of s uh, and center of s prime. to the power uh, beta, something of that sort. OK, and then you also have, of course, the, the double product uh, expected value of n, n squared that you can put into. Well, maybe I should say. OK, then it's a very simple exercise to check that when you do this double sum, well, of course, you could first sum of the first one and then take the sum of all the squares S prime nearby uh, that are over there. So it's like taking the sum of 1 over, uh, you know, you, you take a lattice grid 
and uh, you take the sum over uh, on the lattice grid of one over the distance to the origin to the power beta. And uh, so it's a very simple exercise because beta is smaller than two here to get that basically in this double sum is uh, the leading order term is just the number of pairs of guys, right? So nothing explodes. Uh, the, the ones that are very nearby, you know, you have the in, some, some integral converges and therefore the, the fact that, you know, a couple of guys, a couple of, of these terms have a very large contribution because the distance is very small doesn't play any role. So the simple exercise, uh, first year undergraduate would be sort of that this is a constant times two to the minus n to the uh, two, uh, two to the plus n, sorry. Um, no, minus n. So two to the plus n to the two minus beta squared. So the result is that these two things will tell you just that the expected value of n, n squared is smaller than some universal constant that does not depend on n uh, times expected value of n, n squared. Right? Because we knew that uh, we had this uh, thing here. Okay, so now we're in good shape because you can use what uh, Jeff Steiff called, uh, I don't know, Siegmunds or I don't know, inequality. When you have a random variable like this, when you have a bound like this, then this means that with positive probability, uh, you, you are sure that uh, n is uh, not uh, too small. Uh, okay, so therefore what you get is so now you can conclude that something holds uniformly with positive probability namely that sort of you find some there exists a constant C such that the probability that n n is uh, larger than C times the expected value of n n is larger than C. Okay. Well, if you have this, then obviously You can find a subsequence nk. That's where my subsequence nk came from. <laughs> the other one had no, made no sense. This one makes more sense. So you will be able to find a subsequence nk such that this holds for, inf I mean, for all k in the subsequence. Um, so the subsequence is random. For all nk in the subsequence, uh, this inequality holds with positive probability. So. Let me be more clear. So what I mean is that with positive probability there exists nk going to infinity such that for any k so the nk's are random of course and nk is larger than c expected value of nk So what we, are, what we have now is basically not only that we have an upper bound on the number of balls you need to cover it, but also along some random subsequence, we have some lower bound. So how do we use this in order to construct a measure? So the idea is that what we're going to say is that 
for each n, or for each of these nk, you can define the measure mu nk, right, for instance, to be uh, so uh, 1 over 2 to the minus n nk to the 2 minus beta times um, the sum on the first uh, 2 to the minus nk to the beta squares. Of uh, so maybe I should okay of uh, the uniform measure in S that intersect A. So what I'm doing is the following: you have your set A, you have your small grid here, and I'm just looking at those k for which I know that I have at least n to the you know. Uh, 2 to the plus and k to the 2 minus beta, such guys. So I just want to, I choose the first, you know, bunch, say these ones. So there are that many guys. Okay. So I choose the first, well, <laughs> sorry. I choose the first, uh, I know there are at least that many guys. So I just choose some of them. I take the uniform measure, so I put a mass 1 on each of these first guys, uniformly spread. And then I renormalize in such a way that this is a probability measure. So if, if maybe here we have C here, or some constant C here, we may just say the first sort of a C times this number of guys here. I know this will happen with a positive probability. This will happen along a subsequence NK. Okay. So mu NK. For each k, this is a, for each k such that we have a, at least the, this number of uh, squares. This is a finite measure of mass c, little c. Okay. So now what you want to say is that the set of uh, probability measure on 0, 1 squares is compact. Uh, and therefore, uh, you can extract once you have all these measures. So th they have all uh, the same uh, total mass, little c. So now, when you have this guy, you can extract a, s a subsequence of this uh, here, such that along this subsequence, these measures mu nk converges weakly. Okay? So there exists by compactness, right? So is it clear? So you, you choose, you, say, you look if you have how many things you have. If you have enough, Basically, what mu nk is doing up to a constant is just the uniform measure on the union of these squares. So by compactness, you can find uh, n of phi k that goes to infinity such that mu of n of phi k converges weakly. to uh, a finite measure mu of total mass c. Okay. So this is just because on this set of positive probability, you have this. And once you have this, you have that. So that means that on the set of prob positive probability, you are able, first of all, to construct your infinite sequence of measures mu and k, mu, uh, and k, and then you are able, by compactness, to extract a, sub a subsequence that converges. And there's no you know, uh, mystery or you know, axiom of choice things. You know there are explicit ways to construct a subsequence that uh, will converge. So, so now, now we have our candidate for our measure mu. Right? This is this limiting. Uh, subsequence. So 
So given time, I, but anyway, I'm done. So, so what you get now is just, well, you need to check that mu is the right measure. So you need to check now that on this event with positive probability that happens with positive probability that we have almost surely on this event, well, first of all, that the support of mu is a, a subset of A. Well, this is trivial because the support of the mu of the mu n's is in the neighbor, I mean the epsilon n neighborhood of A. A is a compact set. So uh, the support of mu is uh, in the intersections of uh, the epsilon of the epsilon n neighborhoods of A, so it's in A. So this is where you need the fact that A is compact. Right. Remember that you know how we sampled mu. We said the mu and k. We looked where you know the squares we keep are only those where a is not far away, and then we let uh, these squares become small and small. So it's clear that uh, if you are away from a, uh, there's no chance you contribute to the mass uh, to the measure mu. So that's for free, and you just need to check that e alpha of mu. It's finite, and in order for this guy to be finite, what you need to check is, first of all, that it's smaller than the sup on n on i alpha of mu n, I mean mu of phi k. That's a trivial uh, exercise, just a, it converges like you think it should converge. And then you want to prove that this guy is finite. So how do you prove this is finite? This is a straightforward exercise. You just need to say, well, we know how many squares we have. Right? Uh, so this has to be finite for any alpha. Say we can take any alpha strictly smaller than beta. Okay. And this will work basically just because you have these little squares. You know how many of them you have, and so you count, and it's the same type of argument that says that you have a convergence here that will enable you just to, you know, the, the worst scenarios when they are all, you know, uh, nearby, but then, then you can still uh, work out that the energy of this thing uh, is what you think it is. It's finite. Okay. So, and so I have not, you know, here there are no hidden... Uh, uh, big problems. And so this strategy works. And this is basically tells you why it will be crucial uh, in the SLE framework to see that uh, you need, first of all, two things. You need not only an upper bound on the probability that one point is nearby, but you need these up to constant estimates. That's, that's one crucial uh, thing. So you need to control exactly what the value of the probability that you go uh, close nearby, uh, what it looks like, and to have this upper bound on the second order. And just as a, to conclude, because this will show up in, in Greg's lecture, <coughs> just why are second moments estimates difficult a priori, in the particularly nasty in the case of SLE, uh, and why is the result of the on the dimension a priori if you want to apply exactly this techniques to SLE why is it uh, nasty and I'm sure Greg will come back to that uh, uh, later is 
As I said, the first order estimate computation for SLE is just one of these derivative exponent computations. So it, <coughs> this is something that uh, is doable. And then if I take two points here, z and y, and I want to look at what the probability is, I want to find an upper bound on the probability that I visit both z and y, the neighborhood of z and y. Right? This is the upper bound I need. Well, a priori you would say, well, first the SLE has to go there. And once it's there, I apply the Markov, strong Markov property. You know, I map back. This ball is still pretty close to an epsilon ball. It's, uh, it's pretty close. I mean, it's towards the center. So I will get, once I'm here, I will get exactly what I need. The problem is that there might be, you know, some correlation. Like, imagine, for instance, that the SLE did something like this and that it hits this guy here. Right? So what, if, if you have a picture like this, then somehow once you hit Z, then you will be forced, more or less forced, to visit the neighborhood of Y afterward. Right? So that something, that something might, might have happened before you reach Z that will propel you uh, and tell you, well, now it's, I get there for free. So applying the strong Markov property just will not be enough because you have to exclude these type of configurations. And if you think about it, and that's, uh, you know, uh, what uh, Vincent, uh, that's somehow the, the way uh, the proof of Vincent or the second moment estimate goes, when you want to exclude these things, not only you have to exclude these things, but you have to exclude the way how you build up these things by, you know, going back and forth before Z, between Z and Y many times and, and uh, help, I mean, uh, uh, so what you have to prove somehow is that the exponents corresponding to the configurations have, leading to this type of things have a smaller exponent than the ones, than the beta that you have there, right? So, so you, in, in your upper bound of the second moment, you have the standard second moment estimates. If you would not have been there, then you get the, what you need. And then you need to, well, in the case where I create, you know, I'm a particularly favorable situation when I'm here to get there, this has an even smaller probability to, to have been created in the first place. So there, there are, you have to, you know, uh, so this is what makes it uh, sort of the SLE, second moment computation, problematic and uh, difficult. And that's, and I'm sure Greg will tell you how to overcome this in various ways. Okay, so sorry for being over time. So we, we start at quarter past uh, afterwards because I need to <laughs> rest a little bit. <laughs> okay. No. I yes? So, so the zero, one law that is still missing, that you say is it transferred over in some way into the value law? The answer is yes. I mean, you are going to use the fact that you are looking at the dimension of something that lies inside the domain. When you take the conformal image, that's I haven't said, but you take the conformal image of, of, a, con of a fractal set, uh, because conformal maps are smooth in the inside, uh, so there you have a uniform Lipschitz bound. And because you are smooth inside, this tells you that the house stuff dimension does not change, and therefore it's, it's just a usual, uh, uh, usual Markov property of the Browning motion of the SLE that works. Yeah. Okay. So see you later for the Gaussian free field. Right?